Hello, this is Tom Palm. I'm a National Weather Service forecaster here in the Raleigh office. If you ended up seeing a link to our YouTube video that we included a year ago, this should end up looking pretty familiar to you. Most of this information is unchanged from last year, although we have made a couple of updates for the 2023 season. So first off, which office covers you? There are seven National Weather Service offices that cover portions of North Carolina. Three of them are located in North Carolina, Raleigh, Moorhead City, and Wilmington. However, in the northeastern portion of our state, there are some counties covered by the Wakefield, Virginia office in the northwest, some covered by the Blacksburg, Virginia office. A good chunk of West North Carolina is covered by the Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina office. And then Cherokee and Clay counties are covered by the Knoxville Tri-Cities office. So if you are watching this from North Carolina, this is a map showing you what office is responsible for your area. Raleigh covers 31 counties in Central North Carolina. And these are the 2023 tropical cyclone storms. We have had the A through H storms, and we are seeing if the I storm may be getting named right. So a broad outline for what I will end up going through during this presentation. I'm gonna go through some climatology of hurricanes and tropical cyclones around our area. I'm gonna go through some of the national hurricanes and also talk about some local equivalents that are issued at a local level. I will talk about some of the different hazards for tropical cyclones. Some you may be aware of, some you may not. And then finally, I'll end up spending some time talking about preparing. So overall climatology for the area, the hurricane season officially runs from June 1st to November 30th. Uh, Mother Nature doesn't realize that that is what we officially consider the season. And there have been storms before June 1st. There have been storms after November 30th. The average date of the first named storm in the Atlantic Basin is July 9th. The average date of the first hurricane is August 10th. The average date of the first major hurricane is September 4th, and the average date of the last named storm is November 23rd, so pretty late in the season. And this map ends up showing you, it's, it's slightly out of date, it's from 1966 to 2009, but shows you the average cumulative number of systems per year. So again, through 2009, showing that there were typically 11 named storms each year, six hurricanes, and two major hurricanes, which we consider to be anything that is a category three or a greater storm. This is another way of looking at the climatology. Again, the peak of the season is just a couple weeks away, September 10th. Um, and it says tropical systems can occur May through November. As I said, it could happen earlier or later. Um, you can see that there are a little bit of colors in December and everything, but again, this really does show that that peak, that the number of storms per 100 years is somewhere between 90 and 100 at September 10th. So on average, there is typically a storm somewhere in the Atlantic Basin around. The next two slides are just kind of slightly different versions of taking a look at the tropical cyclone track forecast. The cone represents the probable path of the center of the storm. And I can't stress that enough. The path is the center of the storm. The cone does not show the impacts. Impacts can range well outside of the cone and well away from that dot in the middle. And the center of the storm passes within the cone roughly two thirds of the time. So the National Hurricane Center acknowledges that not all of their forecasts are perfect. Um, and so in this image from Hurricane Florence back in 2018, Again, climatologically, the center of the storm ends up staying within this two thirds of the time. Again, um, a slightly different version of looking at it. Again, this ends up focusing on uh, the track, the position, um, and to form the cone, a set of imaginary circles are placed along the forecast track. That's why this darker color is kind of the day one through three, and then it expands a bit for days four through five. I'm not sure if I'm um, and it encloses 67% of the previous five years official forecast errors. So this does change from year to year. It isn't static. And the scheduled issuances are at 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. p.m. a.m. and p.m. Um, and that is in daylight time. Um, if we have anything going on, once we go back to standard time, that would be at 4 and 10 
a.m. and p.m. This is based off of Zulu time, Greenwich Mean time, military time, um, and it's always issued at 21 and 3z. So what are those official track error trends? Now, this isn't showing the year by year of it, but this is showing over a decade what the average track error is, specifically for the Atlantic Basin. You can see that as the decades have ended up going on, how those uh, track errors have decreased. You can see in the black line showing from 2010 to 2020, that's when forecasts uh, started going out um, to seven days in some cases, um, not for all of them. Um, so you can end up seeing again, we'll end up having another graphic that shows what's going on, but you can see that through time through each decade, you can see that looking at a 72 hour forecast, a three day forecast in the 60s, the center would be off by a little more than 400 miles. If we end up going 2010 through 2020, you can see that that's improved all the way to about a hundred mile error. And if you go back to uh, the, the purple and blue and the green line, that was the average forecast error at about 18 hours or 24 hours in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So the, the 24 hour error in the 80s is now about the error that we have at three days. So at least when it comes to that average track error, we are, we, we, I say we like I've been one of those forecasters. The Hurricane Center has been consistent in the improvement of those track errors. Now, what is the radius of the cone this year? Like I said, this changes every year by, by a mile or two or three. But the cone, this these are the numbers here showing what that radius is. So this year, the cone for a 72-hour forecast is going to be 99 nautical miles and 205 miles wide for a 120-hour forecast. And how has that forecast cone changed over time? I showed you on a chart, but here it is actually in a plan view um, showing what would end up happening and how large the cone would end up being between 2005 and 2020. So again, the Hurricane Center has their error built right into the forecast. They know that the storms aren't going to track exactly where they end up showing it. That error is built into the forecast product itself. And so just taking a look at things locally, what the difference was in an average three-day track forecast for Floyd in 1999 compared to Dorian in 2019. Again, really bringing it to the local level, showing how much smaller those track errors are. Now, there hasn't been as much improvement in the official intensity forecast. You can see in the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s that overall, those lines didn't really change that much in what the average intensity error was. And this is in knots, knots and nautical miles because we're, we're dealing with something over the ocean and water. Um, a nautical mile is, I want to say it's 6,000 feet instead of 5,280 feet, so a little bit more than a mile per hour. Um, but you can see that after about 48 hours uh, in the 2010s that there was a bit more of an improvement in the intensity forecasts um, starting at, four, at hour 48 and going all the way through the forecast period. But still, that's kind of about a category on average in the So how do we define all of these different terms? A tropical depression is something that has less than 39 mile an hour winds and it must have a closed surface circulation. Sometimes you might end up having stronger winds, but there isn't a full on low pressure system that's closed off. So we need to have that closed circulation for something to be declared a tropical depression. A tropical storm is gonna be anything from 39 to 73 miles an hour. A hurricane is 74 miles an hour or greater. And then as I said earlier, a major hurricane, a category three, four, five storm is 111 miles an hour or greater for the winds. Now the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale is used to categorize hurricane strength and to give an estimate on potential problems. And I wanna emphasize here, it is a hurricane wind scale. The Saffir Simpson scale ranges from uh, a category one to a category five, and this only includes wind impacts. This does not include anything about flooding. This does not include anything about 
rain. This does not include anything about storm surge. All of those can be very big impacts from a storm. Saffir Simpson scale is just a wind scale. So there are certainly other hazards. And just because something is only a category one storm doesn't mean that it can't still have serious, serious impacts. So again, category one, 74 to 95 miles an hour, very dangerous winds will produce some damage going all the way up to a category five, 157 miles an hour or higher where catastrophic damage will occur. So what is the return period for a hurricane? I don't know what the source is of this individual map, but it's showing uh, several counties all the way along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast and showing the approximate return period that over time, what the average length is in time between having hurricanes impacting these locations. You can see that Southern Florida gets their stuff, Southeastern Louisiana and North Carolina end up sticking out. Uh, you can see that as you go a little bit farther north, you can see that the Cape Cod Peninsula and Massachusetts itself sticks out a little bit more. Um, but if you end up going up along Maine, it can be you know, an, an average of 50 years between having a hurricane impact that county. And then this is looking specifically at the major hurricanes. 111 miles an hour converts to 96 knots. So I'll leave this up on the screen for a minute. So what are the new 1991 to 2020 seasonal averages? The National Weather Service computes climatology every 10 years. And so the average Atlantic hurricane season that became effective in 2021 is that we are now up to 14 named storms, seven hurricanes and three major hurricanes. And again, this is not a forecast. This is just saying that looking at the numbers over those 30 years that, um, so 1991 to 2010 was in both of those data sets. So if you compare 1981 to 19, from the range from 1981 to 1990, and you compare that to 2011 to 2020, that is where the big, the difference ended up occurring in the fact that there were more named storms and more hurricanes. This could be attributed to several different things. Uh, the overall improvement in observing platforms, the fact that we're able to resolve more features with satellite data, with increased radar data, uh, different technologies such as the Hurricane Hunter planes flying in and, and dropping radio sons, drop sons into the hurricane to get more data. It could be due to the warming ocean and atmosphere, which are influenced by climate change over various time cycles. All right, so that's it for the climatology. Now we'll start moving to some of the National Hurricane Center projects. This is something that is done with some collaboration. So the National Hurricane Center is located in Miami, Florida. They forecast the track intensity for all tropical cyclones around North America. So Atlantic Basin and a lot of the Pacific Basin as well. The local office here in Raleigh, we are forecasting the impacts of a particular storm. We are forecasting the threats for we are looking at everybody in our local area in that 31 county area that earlier. So we work together, we work in collaboration with the National Hurricane Center to decide where and when to issue the tropical storm and hurricane watches and warnings. So taking a look at the tropical weather outlook, this is from about a week ago. This isn't an up-to-date one. Um, but a change that happened this year is that it's now a seven-day graphical tropical weather outlook, as opposed to a five-day outlook as it was before. So this is issued four times a day. Again, it's generally 8 and 2 a.m. and p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So again, uh, moving back to standard time in November, that would change the times that it's issued. And so again, this is the chance of tropical cyclone formation potential for the next seven days. So if we take a look at the legend at the bottom, yellow is going to be anything less than 40%. Anything that's orange is 40 to 60%, and anything that's red is a greater than 60% chance. And so in this particular one, there is this X showing potential for something in the Gulf, a red X in the Caribbean. We had uh, Tropical Depression 6, we had Tropical Storm Emily, 
and then another area of uh, potential formation that has just been coming off of Africa. So the watch phase, this is going to be when there is a forecast of sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or higher that are possible within a specified area within 48 hours. And then the tropical storm watch is sustained winds of 39 to 73 miles an hour possible within 48 hours. If the threat is still three days, four days, five days out, we are not issuing watches for that. Um, you know, we are certainly going to be talking about it locally, but the National Hurricane Center will not be issuing any official products for something that might impact an area in three days. As opposed to the warning phase, and this is when, for hurricane warning, sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or higher are expected somewhere within the specified area within 36 hours. And again, tropical storm warning, the sustained winds of 39 to 73 miles an hour are expected within 36 hours. So 48 hours for a watch, within 36 hours for a warning product. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this training in the first place was to talk about potential tropical cyclone advisories. This is something that the National Hurricane Center can issue before a tropical depression or a tropical storm forms. And it provides the agency the ability to issue a watch with the full 48 hours of lead time for a watch or full 36 hours of lead time for a warning for a possible tropical storm, hurricane, or life-threatening storm surge conditions on land. And it contains all of the standard National Hurricane Center advisory text and graphical products. And so this was just kind of a hypothetical and it has been issued a few times, but I wanted to give you an example from just earlier this week. So if you take a look at that graphic on the upper left, and again, I purposely overlapped these, I wanted them to all show up in the same slide. So at 11 a.m. Eastern time, Monday morning, potential tropical cyclone nine was named um, in the sense that it hadn't closed off yet. So it was not, it didn't have a closed circulation. So it wasn't a tropical, but it was a potential tropical cyclone. And so at that time, a tropical storm warning was issued for the southern Texas coast along the tropical storm watch. In the middle plot, six hours later, the circulation had closed off and it was now tropical depression nine. And you can see that the cone shifted just barely to the south. But you could see that the projection was that it would end up increasing to a tropical storm later on that night. And in the bottom right, at the intermediate advisory that was issued at 2 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, they had determined that Tropical Depression 9 had strengthened to Tropical Storm Herald. And so it now received a name and was still expected to be making landfall later that day and then end up becoming a depression. So yes, this whole idea of a potential tropical cyclone advisory, I had been concerned that people wouldn't know what that meant. So I really wanted to have this presentation in a large part to explain that to people and what that means. So just in this past week, we had potential tropical cyclone nine become tropical depression nine, which eventually became tropical storm. So the National Hurricane Center also ends up putting key message graphics together. This is something that they are doing on, on a large scale. There's not, um, it, it's meant to cover the entire storm itself. And so this combines key messages from the National Hurricane Center discussions and the pertinent advisory graphics. And they're available on the National Hurricane Center social media accounts and also on the National Hurricane Center website. So this was from uh, one of the messages from Hurricane Laura back in 2020. So the three bullets on the left hand side were some of the key messages from the official Hurricane Center discussion. The upper right image was showing the official track and the bottom right graphic might be several different types of graphics. For this particular one, they were looking at the broad rainfall forecast that was expected to occur. Again, more of the products that are issued by the National Hurricane Center. So this would end up being the earliest reasonable arrival time of tropical storm force winds. And it's the reasonable worst case scenario. It identifies a window the preparation should be made by. And while times are given, especially farther out, you should really focus in more general terms. 
you cannot take this graphic and end up figuring out exactly what's going on to the hour. It's just going to be using six to 12 hour increments. So instead of saying Wednesday 8 p.m. or Thursday 8 a.m. as Florence's, the forecast of Florence was expected to reach North Carolina, that should be considered sometime late Wednesday or early Thursday as opposed to um, trying to get specific down to an hour. There's also a most likely arrival time, tropical storm force winds. And again, this is from a different storm from tropical storm. And this is the most likely scenario. This is when we expect it to end up occurring. Um, and again, while times are given farther out, focus more general. So don't look at the line and say, okay, it's gonna get to Cape Hatteras at 8 a.m. on Monday. It should be considered as sometime Monday morning. All right, so those are some of the National Hurricane Center graphics now we'll, or products. Now we'll end up talking about some of the hazards. And as I talked about earlier, tropical cyclones produce more than just wind. Just because the Saffir Simpson scale is a wind scale doesn't mean that you can't have serious impacts from rainfall, flooding, storm surge, rip currents, wind, and tornadoes. Water is the big killer when it comes to tropical cyclone fate. Again, this graphic is slightly out of date, only includes fatalities through 2012. But in that 50 year period, nearly half of fatalities in the United States from tropical cyclones came from storm surge. But if you end up looking, there was also a large part from rain, surf, and offshore. So water accounts for about 90% of the direct deaths, just the other 12% wind tornadoes or other categories. This is taking a look back at Hurricane Florence, and you can end up seeing on the left-hand side what the five-day rainfall forecast was. So as we go from this, um, you know, you, you have these different reds and oranges and yellows and getting into these purples. Um, this storm was still about 200 miles away from Wilmington at that point, but you can see that a lot of those purples did end up occurring in the observed rainfall on the right-hand side. Some places got almost three feet of rain. And so you can see at the bottom that these forecasts really ended up doing a good job at, at a five day forecast. Um, but 16 out of 17 blood related fatalities were in vehicles. So, so people still uh, needed to be a little bit more cautious when they were in their vehicles, even with, with this rainfall forecast, they needed to be concerned about that. The second deadliest Atlantic Basin storm in 2019 was Lorenzo even though it ended up remaining well off the coast of the United States. Um, there were 19 direct fatalities, all of which were water related. Um, there were eight rip current deaths in the United States alone, four in North Carolina. Um, and so dangerous rip currents can occur well ahead of approaching storms. And again, Lorenzo didn't even end up coming near the United States itself, but it still ended up causing fatalities. But just in general, when it comes to beach safety, we, we're in central North Carolina, but we know that plenty of people are going to be, you know, traveling out to the beach, have already gone out there this summer, may go out there again. It's important to choose a beach with a lifeguard on duty. You'll want to pay attention to signs and flags that let you know where there could be danger. Make sure that everyone, especially children, has adult supervision at all times when in the water, even if those people know how to swim. And make sure you do not become a victim when you're trying to help someone else. Get help from a lifeguard. If there is not a lifeguard present, call 911 and direct the victim to swim following the shoreline to escape if there is a rip current. Possible try and throw something that floats to the person. And if you are in doubt about the water danger, don't go out. Um, we really want to focus on rip currents. Um, you can end up seeing in this graphic on the left hand side that rip currents are relatively narrow in nature. Um, if you are caught in a rip current, um, they don't pull you down. They generally pull you out to sea. So you don't want to try and swim against the current itself, considering how strong it is. You want to swim parallel to the shore. You want to swim out of the rip current and then come back to the shore. If you can't escape, try and float or tread water. And if you need help, yell or wave for assistance. Let people know. Tornadoes are also a threat when it ends up coming to tropical cyclones that are making landfall. These typically occur on the right side of the storm. This is the side where winds are blowing on shore and that's bringing warm, moist, tropical air inland. 
As the hurricane is making landfall, friction slows winds close to the surface while winds are still spinning rapidly aloft. And so when we have that wind profile with slower winds at the surface and stronger winds higher up in the atmosphere, that is favorable for tornadoes to form. And tornadoes that are spawned from tropical systems are rarely accompanied by lightning and even more rarely associated with hail. And also these tornadoes are typically very short lived, which can make it very hard for us to end up detecting them and to put warnings out ahead of time. These tornadoes can end up occurring even between our radar scans um, to the point where we might not be able to see it on a radar ahead of time to give somebody notice that it's coming. So again, the friction over the land causes those low level wind conditions that are favorable. So if this storm is moving from the southeast to the northwest, everything on the right side, kind of that northeastern part of it, um, and then that, that dashed line is, is kind of showing the front or the back of the storm. So if you take that X, kind of the top part, considering how the storm is moving, would be considered the right front quadrant of the storm where tornadoes would be the largest threat. The local time zones in National Hurricane Center products. Um, so if a product is issued at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Eastern Time Zone, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Central would be 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the Atlantic Time Zone is 11 a.m. Atlantic Standard Time. So Atlantic Standard versus Eastern Daylight, also Greenwich Mean Time, again, Zulu Time, or something is right off the coast of Africa could be listed as Cape Verde Time. Some of the more localized products that you can end up looking at at an Eastern Region Weather Forecast Office tropical webpage. So you can see right up there towards the top, weather.gov slash RAH slash tropical. It's gonna be your one-stop shop for all tropical related local forecast information tailored to each local forecast area. The active storms tab will become active when the Hurricane Center has tropical cyclone advisories out. Um, you can see all these different tabs. Again, this happens to be from the Corpus Christi page. However, the Raleigh page would look similar, showing an outlook, active storms, threatened impacts, local products, satellite, radar, social media preparedness, and links. And so this would be, again, at a more local level showing uh, a zoomed in version. This was for Hurricane Harvey back in 2017, what that would end up looking like for your local area. Again, another thing that you would end up seeing on the tropical page, the threats and impacts contain uh, the HDI, the Hurricane Threats and Impacts Fact, Frequently Asked Questions, but changes to the threat and impact information itself when there is the active storm. And this communicates threats and potential impacts for each tropical hazard in the local area, including wind, storm surge, flooding rain, and tornadoes. Now we would not end up having storm surge inland in central North Carolina, but we certainly could end up having the wind, the flooding rain, and the tornadoes. And this is designed to help communicate the degree of preparation that's gonna be needed with a safety margin factored in for each of these particular threats. And again, you can end up clicking on those radio buttons above the map to end up seeing the difference for each of those individual threats. The local products tab is shown when there is an active storm impacting our particular forecast office. And the entire text of a hurricane local statement can be viewed here. And then there are pull downs uh, kind of in this upper right hand corner. Um, working right up in here. Um, additional products that would be available include the extreme wind warnings, coastal hazards, surf zone forecasts, flash flood warnings, flood warnings, local storm reports, post tropical cyclone reports, and public information statements. Satellite and radar data is always available from those two tabs. There's also always a preparedness tab that you can take a look at to get quick access to local evacuation maps, preparedness guides, and videos. So again, some of the products that we may be issuing ourselves would be a hazardous weather outlook. That would probably be the first product that we would issue. Hazardous weather outlook is not specific to tropical storms or hurricanes. They are designed to alert 
any of our customers to expected hazardous weather and its potential out to seven days. So this is an example from uh, uh, HWO that went out before Hurricane Florence ended up arriving. And so at 5 a.m. on Tuesday, there wasn't expected hazardous weather on Tuesday or Tuesday night, but it was saying that Hurricane Florence was forecast to be a powerful major hurricane on its approach to the coast of the Southeast United States late Wednesday through early Friday. The associated risk of life-threatening impacts well inland in the central North Carolina, including damaging wind tornadoes and prolonged extreme heavy rain is increasing. Um, so this is kind of the first place that we would, from a local office perspective, end up trying to let people know in the official product what's going on, along with our area forecast discussions. Tropical cyclone local watch and warning statements are a good source of meteorological threat and impact for those who deal on a smaller scale. This is going to be based on a county level. It drives all further downstream notification, whether that's the emergency alert system, no other radio, watch warning displays on weather.gov websites, and wireless emergency alerts. However, a local watch warning statement is not a good source of information for the media or others who require the big picture. This is really trying to focus on an individual county. So again, this particular one, taking a look from Florence. So this product was specifically for Cumberland County and was issued at 11 p.m. on Thursday, September 13th. So it was saying that the wind forecast was equivalent to a tropical storm force wind with a peak wind forecast of 35 to 45 miles an hour with gusts to 55 miles an hour. And the window for tropical storm force windows for windows. The window for tropical storm force winds was going to last until Saturday afternoon. And just in general, um, the potential threat to life and property would be up to 58 to 73 miles an hour. That threat had decreased from the previous assessment, but was still saying what the plan should be, what the preparation should be, and how to act. All of that is compared to a hurricane local statement, which is a concise summary of significant potential impacts from tropical cyclone for the forecast area of responsibility. And this is a good source of information for the media or others who want the big picture. It is not a source of meteorological and threat information for those who are looking on a smaller scale. It is not a source of official watch and warning. The hurricane local statement and the local watch warning statement complement each other. So the HLS format, Again, taking a look at, at Florence, there was a headline that said Hurricane Florence expected to bring life-threatening flooding to course in central North Carolina. At that particular time, there had not been any changes to the watches and warnings in the last six hours. The current watches and warnings was that there was a hurricane warning in effect for Sampson and Wayne counties, with a tropical storm warning in effect for several other counties. that will tell you about the storm information. We get to pick two different points to say where the storm is compared to those. So. At this time, the storm is approximately 160 miles southeast of Raleigh, or about 140 miles east-southeast of Fayetteville. It gives the latitude and longitude of the center of the storm, what the current storm intensity is, and what the current storm movement is. And then just a broad situation overview. Dangerous Hurricane Florence will slowly approach the far southern coast of North Carolina tonight, and then move westward over southeast North Carolina and northeast South Carolina through Friday. The storm will then continue a slow inland drift over South Carolina through the weekend. So again, not getting very specific, just looking at things in a broad sense. This shows the area of the National Weather Service Tropical Product Suite issuance. So any office in green issues the full set of hurricane products and it ended up working out very well that if you look on the left side of your screen, that the San Diego office and Los Angeles office issued some tropical cyclone products last year and just started issuing all of them this calendar year. And so they were certainly issuing uh, these products as Hurricane Hillary was approaching the area. So wireless emergency alerts are typically something that you may have received before when it comes to a local tornado warning or a flash flood warning. Wireless emergency alerts are an alerting network in the United States designed to share emergency alerts to mobile devices such as smartphones and cell phones. And when it comes to a tropical sense, these can be triggered by the weather service for the following tropical warnings. For hurricane warnings, again, the category one storm or greater, 
for extreme wind warnings, and those are when category three winds are expected inland, and also storm surge warnings. Although we, the Raleigh office, would not be issuing any storm surge warnings. There are Spanish messages available for devices where Spanish is set as the primary language. Uh, those with 3G service or lower will still receive 90 character messages as opposed to 360 character messages. So you can see examples of those shorter messages on the right side where it would say tornado warning in this area until a particular time and date, big shelter, check low warning. Sorry, I, I read the tornado warning one. Uh, hurricane warning, hurricane warning in this area, check local media and authorities. And again, with 360 characters, you'll be able to get uh, more specific information. You can always go to our website, weather.gov slash Raleigh. And on that map, you can end up clicking on a point and click on the hourly weather forecast. And then you can end up looking at our specific forecast for your area. On this particular map, I have the temperature in red. I have the sustained wind speed with gusts and then what the sky coverage is. And you can mouse over this. If you're looking at it on the computer, um, you can also use your finger if you are on the smartphone um, to end up looking at what the specific values are going to be for your location at any given time, what our official forecast is for your location. Finally, want to speak to some preparedness issues. Before the storm, you would want to determine your risk. Again, if you are in central North Carolina, storm surge should not end up being an issue. But would it be strong winds? Could you have You'd want to develop an evacuation plan. You'd want to plan several routes and plan for your pets as well, what you would do with them. You would want to assemble disaster supplies, food and water, medicine, having cash on hand in case ATMs aren't available because of powder out, power outage, et cetera. Uh, make sure that you know what your insurance is, what your policy is, have your documents with you if you need them. Strengthen your home. You might want to cover your windows or move a vehicle to a safe location. I want to help your neighbors evacuate. Again, this is all before the storm. Um, and complete a written plan. You might want to have a contact list. You might want to have a contact outside of the impact area from the storm and, and share your plan with family and friends. So again, uh, a little bit more information. Uh, disaster supply kit. You would want to have non-perishable food and water. That would be enough to last for at least seven days. Canned food and juices, a non-electric can opener. Um, it's recommended that you have one gallon of water per person per day um, for toilet use, for drinking, um, for any sort of bathing that you might end up doing. You'd want to have cooking tools and fuel, paper plates and utensils, masks and hand sanitizer. Um, again, supplies for your infants or pets, blankets and pillows, clothing, personal items, waterproof flashlights, a no weather radio or AM FM radios that are battery powered. A first aid kit, you'd want a charge cell phone and hopefully an extra battery or traditional landline telephone. Um, and again, you probably want to have some cash on hand because if there's power outage, the ATMs won't end up having power. So if you're under a hurricane watch, you want to be monitoring your no weather radio and or your local media. Make sure that you have that disaster supply kit ready to go. You'd want to make sure that you have gas for your automobile to make sure that you aren't running to the gas station at the last second. You'd want to bring in any outdoor items that you can bring inside. If you can't bring something outside, you'd want to make sure that you tie things down. Board up any windows. You'd probably want to turn your refrigerator and freezer to the coldest settings just to make sure that everything is as cold as it can be in advance and minimize the use and preparation for extended power loss. Make sure you have all your prescriptions and over-the-counter medication ready and have it near or in your first aid kit. Decide where you're going to go if you evacuate, depending on the track of the storm, um, if it's going to be heading along Interstate 40, going inland, or if it's going to be going up Interstate 95. Um, that might end up changing where you decide that you want to evacuate to. Expect major congestion along those evacuation routes. Hotels are likely going to fill up quickly along those major interstates. Considering where it is, people, if, if something was moving from Florida up in our direction, you might already have a bunch of Florida residents evacuating into North Carolina. So you might need to, to go even further. If a hurricane warning is in effect, that generally means you're less than 36 hours before the impact of the storm. You'll want to continue to monitor 
the National Weather Service radio, local media. You would want to be alert for and heed any evacuations that are valid for you. If you decide to evacuate or you are asked to evacuate, you want to make sure that you turn off your main water and gas supplies. Make sure that somebody outside of the hurricane warning area knows what your plans are. Again, you might not be in Central North Carolina listening to this. If you live in a storm surge zone and time permits, again, place all of your indoor items as high as you can. Make sure you bring emergency supplies, warm clothing, blankets, and sleeping bags. However, if you decide that your home is your best shelter, you'll want to stay as far away from exterior walls and windows as possible. You'll want to keep as many flashlights and batteries as possible near you. And if the storm nears, follow the same safety rules that you would for a tornado. Again, trying to stay towards that interior wall, interior rooms of your own. Okay. After the storm, you're going to want to continue to monitor all available media sources. Do not return home unless you are advised to by authorities. Be prepared to assist injured people, people who might have tried to ride out the storm, people will come back. You want to stay away from any downed power lines and make sure to report those to officials. Also be alert for wild animals that might have been forced from their homes. You were not the only person displaced by the storm. And make sure that any food that you have that is left at your house was not spoiled before you consume it. And more things to be concerned about after the storm. Make sure you take photos of storm damage before altering it for the sake of insurance purposes. If your home is damaged, open up doors and windows to try and ventilate and dry out your house. You'll want to minimize the telephone use and the driving. Everybody else is going to try and be using the telephone as well. Be alert for any gas leaks, electrical system damage, or sewer and water line issues. And that wraps up the presentation. I have some acknowledgments. A lot of the material that I have in these slides came from the people that I've listed here. Chris Strong at the Sterling, Virginia office, Eric Heaton at the Moorhead City, North Carolina office, Jesse Smith at the Melbourne, Florida office, and also the National Weather Service Southern Region headquarters in Fort Worth. They all had a lot of really good information that I was able to use and include in this presentation and it made putting this together much easier.